Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Christopher Stone, Senior Fellow for Space Studies here at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence, and welcome to our Schriever Space Power Forum series. We're very pleased to have with us Dr. Derek Tournier, the Director of Space Development Agency. And for those of you not familiar with the SDA, it was created to help unify and integrate space capability development and deployment across the Department of Defense to achieve the DOSD space vision, while also reducing overlap and inefficiency. Dr. Tournier previously served as the Assistant Director for Space for the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, responsible for developing the Research and Engineering Roadmap to address future gaps in the DoD space architecture. He also has an extensive experience in industry where he was Director for Research and Development for Harris Space and Intelligence. Welcome, sir, and thanks very much for making time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's exciting to be here in the Mitchell Institute and, and see all of the all of the air power artifacts around it. Uh, you know, it's very exciting to, to be able to talk about the, the future of, of space in, in such an environment. Thank you. So I, I'd like to kick things off today by giving you an opportunity to give everyone a quick overview of SDA and its main efforts through some opening remarks. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, that, uh, you know, it's exciting to talk about uh, talk about everything that SDA has been up to and, and our plans to be able to deliver capabilities to the warfighter extremely quickly. That's our, that's our mission. Speed, delivery, agility. Get capabilities in the hand of the warfighter as, as rapidly as possible. You know, and, and SDA, we've been around since 2019. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done over the last year. And then more importantly, what our, what our near-term plans are, because that's 2022 is going to be an exciting and, and, uh, and a very impactful year for the Space Development Agency. So just over a year ago, we delivered our first two experimental satellites to the launch pad. And this was nine months after we received funding. So that shows just how quick one can go within the department from funding to be able to get capabilities to the launch pad ready to go. Now, unfortunately, there was a there was a launch vehicle in, uh, integration uh, mishap that occurred. So we weren't able to launch in January, but we were able to repair those satellites and launch them just six months later. And along with that, we launched a total of six satellites in, in 2021. So uh, we did several different missions to demonstrate that we could do laser communication. That really is going to be the enabler for the future for a lot of these capabilities. And then we also did some, some experiments that we teamed with, with DARPA to show that we can do onboard processing. And then we did our final experiment teamed with the Missile Defense Agency to demonstrate that we could actually collect data OPIR, overhead persistent infrared imagery data from LEO to be able to pull out background information. And that's going to be used to, to, to set what our algorithms will be in the future. And so all of those were, were very exciting and, and successful missions to go through. Oh, so so um, now after we've solidified all of our tranche zero, so these are 28 satellites, just to, just to keep this in perspective, we are 37 weeks away from launching our tranche zero. Tranche Zero is made up of 28 satellites, 20 which make up the data transport layer. Those satellites will, will form a mesh network optically connected with laser crosslinks. They'll also be able to do those laser crosslinks down to the ground and down to airborne users. In addition to that, some of those satellites also have Link 16 so they can go directly into existing tactical data links. That's important. That's one of the, one of the goals of SDA is to be able to make sure that we can get connectivity to space to existing tactical data links. We don't want to force people to have to get new terminals to be able to plug into these networks. That's key to make sure that we get this rapid adoption for the warfighter. In addition, we will also have KA band downlinks from those 20 transport satellites to allow them to tie directly into various JADC2 components of the, the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force using that, that KA band. Now that's the 20 satellites, and then we have eight additional ones that are providing the OPIR, so the overhead persistent infrared imagery that will make up the, the start of the tracking layer. That tracking layer will allow us to detect and track hypersonic glide vehicles and, and other, other missile threats. We'll detect those, send those data directly to the transport layer, and then transport can send that down to the ground where it can be fused with other data and then send that out and, and essentially make a fire control solution that could be sent to something like Aegis that could, that could engage. So that's, that's the goal of our tranche zero, 37 weeks away from that. Now, moving forward, we're into tranche one. So we are currently in source selection for our tranche one transport layer. Those are 144 satellites, 126 of our baseline satellites, 
and then 18 experimental satellites. That makes up our tranche one transport layer. That will form what we call the initial warfighting capability, the ability to actually form a mesh network and get those data down via Link 16 to the warfighter in the field so that we can actually affect a fight. That's starting in September of 2024 is when those will be launched every two years. That's the, that's the, that's the goal of SDA. So if you look at, at what we've accomplished, we've accomplished not only those demonstration satellites, like I said, just, just a couple hundred days after receiving funding, to being able to put our tranche zero on contract. And for folks tracking acquisition out there, we average about 100 days from a solicitation to contract award. So that's, that's, that's pretty unprecedented within the department for these large contracts. And then tranche one, we're in source selection. We expect to, to make uh, announcements of that award here within the next, next few weeks. In addition, some things to look forward to going in, in 2022, we're going to start our solicitation for our tranche one tracking layer. So this will be uh, on the order of 28 uh, satellites to be able to do the tracking mission. So that's that OPIR missile tracking mission. Those will be launched uh, in that 2024, 2025 timeframe so that we can start to actually cover the globe so that we can actually provide capabilities to the warfighter for the tracking mission in addition to the data transport mission. You'll also see an operations and integration, which is essentially the, the ground layer that ties all of our constellations together. So that, that solicitation will come out uh, it, probably next week is when we expect that solicitation to hit the street. And then we'll make an award early in 2022. Those uh, individuals, whoever wins that award, will be operating the satellites out of two operation centers that we're building out. One at Grand Forks Air Force Base, and then the other down in Redstone Arsenal. So we have a, a facility in Grand Forks and a facility in Huntsville, and that's where we'll be able to do the command and control and the network operations of the satellite. So all of that, all of that will be kicked off and, and started in 2022. Also in 2022, if you, if you look forward, we're going to have, I mentioned that we have 144 satellites, 126 baseline satellites, and then 18 of the experimental satellites. Those 18 experimental satellites will be solicited in 2022, likely in the early summer of 2022, we'll put out the solicitation for those. And, and then that will essentially be for experimental uh, payloads and UHF payloads that will go on board those 18 satellites. All right, 2022 will also, at the 37 weeks, uh, we will launch our tranche zero, but right after the launch of our tranche zero, we will transition into the Space Force. So there's a lot of questions on, on what that looks like. So the Space Development Agency was, was established to be the constructive disruptor within the department. Uh, what that means is we were established to show that we could form a completely new architecture, the architecture that we coined the National Defense Space Architecture, based on two pillars, proliferation, hundreds and hundreds of satellites, and then spiral development. Every two years, we'll put up new capabilities based on what industry can produce and deliver within that two-year time frame. Well, we've demonstrated that, and we'll, we'll make sure that, that, that the reality of that concept is demonstrated in 37 weeks, and then again with tranche one in September of 2024. So at that point, SDA will be into the model of actually operating these satellites in an operational construct. And for that, uh, that we need to be part of the Space Force. We need to be actually part of a service, not an independent defense agency to do that. And so that's why we're folding into the Space Force in October of 2022, so that we can make sure that everything we deliver can be operationalized and put into the hands of the warfighter, because that's the, that's the end goal. Now, working within the Space Force uh, and the Air Force, we've, we've kind of, uh, the law is actually pretty clear on what will happen to, to SDA at that transition. We will be a direct reporting unit to the, the Chief of Space Operations, and then we will also have our acquisition authority reporting directly to the new Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration, uh, which uh, the nominee, uh, uh, Mr. Frank Cavelli, has just been uh, been nominated for. So, so that, that's kind of the, the plan going forward in, in 2022. So the reason we've been able to, to make these advancements, you know, one of the, one of the Heilmeyer questions is, you know, why now? Why, why do you think your concept is, is, uh, is able to be effective now, whereas it may not have been successful in the past. And I would say that that's because of the explosive growth in the commercial sector. 
So the commercial sector for these proliferated satellites has really set up an infrastructure to where now the components are commoditized so that we can produce these satellites in two-year centers very affordably because of the fact that there's so many of them that are being produced for the commercial industry right now. So that's that's number one. And then the second aspect, the, the price of launch has really dropped precipitously. And because of that, uh, essentially you've gotten out of this model where you need to add more and more capabilities to make your satellite so expensive because you're taking advantage of an expensive launch where now you can capitalize on affordable launch so you can make your satellites more affordable. So you can go into this, get out of this death spiral of increasing requirements and increasing cost and get into a spiral development where you actually field capabilities every two years. So that's what we have going forward. That's where we've, we've done. So we've, we've demonstrated that we can in fact be the constructive disruptor. We've hit all the milestones we've set out to hit. And, uh, and the next big milestone is that, that launch in 37 weeks. We anticipate hitting that and moving forward to demonstrate that, that this whole concept of proliferation and LEO to be able to, to provide the tactical connectivity directly to the warfighter will in fact materialize. Well, thanks very much for that background. Um, I wanted to thank you also for that rapid innovation. It sounds like you got a lot of really awesome stuff going on. And uh, for the first question, though, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the tracking layer, if you will. One of the most recent topics that we've been interested in here at the Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence is this past summer's demonstration by China of a fractional orbital bombardment system dropping a hypersonic glide vehicle. And as most people understand, our space-based and ground-based early warning systems radars and satellites are designed primarily for ICBMs flying standard ballistic flight paths and, uh, and support theater missile warning as well. So more, more of a traditional what we're used to. And with this new demo, it appears that the Chinese are showing they might have the capability to operationalize this. And we were just wondering um, what is SDA doing to help mitigate this concern in addition to the standard ICBM threat? Yes, exactly. So one of the key things to keep in mind when you, when you talk about these hypersonic glides and, and the fractional orbit, and, and in fact, you know, any, any orbital bombardment system, just the fact that this last one was demonstrated as a fractional orbital system doesn't, doesn't mean that there's really any physics limitation for putting, putting that reentry vehicle on orbit and, and having it reenter at any time at any place. So that's, that's one of the key things. And so there are two aspects that need to that you need to think about when you're when you're looking at at warning and then ultimately defeat of such a threat. So the first step is you have to be able to detect it. All right. Once you once you can detect it, uh, then you can then you can start to, to use those data for something. And as you mentioned, all of our current systems are set up in a way so that they are they are engineered towards the threat that was you know the 1970s threat through the 80s and 90s, it's, it's, it's incrementally improved, but it's, it's been a fixed threat that you knew essentially where the, where, the, where the missile would come from. And then once you had an early detection, you could predict the impact point very rapidly. Uh, now, nowadays, everything, I, I always quote uh, Rich Ritter from the Missile Defense a Agency, all the missiles nowadays are jinxing and jinxing, right? So they're, they're all maneuverable, whether or not they're fractional orbital or, or uh, even some of, the, some of the more ballistic ones. And then especially once you get into the hypersonic glide vehicles, they all can change their impact point. And so you need to be able to detect them throughout the flight. So that's where, that's where the tracking layer really comes in, because the tracking layer by virtue of, of being in a low Earth orbit versus a, versus a geosynchronous orbit, that buys you a couple things. Number one, it buys you more global coverage, right? So you, you get global coverage from geosynchronous satellites by having them around the belt. That gives you uh, most of the mid-latitude and low-latitude coverage, which works really well. And then historically, you have put very high satellites in polar orbits that give you the polar coverage that you can't really see from geosynchronous orbit. And that works, that works pretty well. But the fact that you're, you know, you're on the order of 40,000 kilometers away from the threat means that, the, the, that you cannot really detect dim targets just by the, the sense that the, the radiated energy of the, of the heat signature goes out as, as one over the distance squared. Uh, the further away you are, the more difficult it is to detect such a signature. So in the low Earth orbit regime, we can actually detect 
signatures that are lower, that are essentially dimmer than what you can detect from these, these higher orbits, the geosynchronous orbits. So that allows you to, to detect these targets, not during the initial boost phase when you can see you know, the, the bright bloom from the rocket engine, but you can see the hypersonic glide vehicles as they're maneuvering and getting hot. So that's the idea. That's one of the big advantages of, of the LEO orbits. So it allows you to do that. So then once you do the detection, uh, you can you can detect, you can have several satellites. That's another advantage of LEO. You can have several satellites with, with different angles that allow you to, to get different look angles so you can get a good geometric dilution of precision, if you will, to calculate the three-dimensional track very accurately. All right, so that's one aspect. Now I can detect the saddle. I can detect the hypersonic glide vehicle. I can give you a track, but that track is, is uh, changing in time. It's maneuverable. So the next aspect, and this is where the transport layer comes in, the next aspect is I need to be able to move those data from the tracking satellites down to the shooter as rapidly as possible. So the tracking satellites need to be connected directly with the transport satellites via these laser optical crosslinks so that then they can move a large amount of data to the transport layer. And then the transport layer can do two things. It can move it anywhere in the world. So I can move it to a targeting cell that could be located in Hawaii, it could be located in, in Colorado. And then I can actually use that to fuse it with other data sets to calculate a fire control solution. Or if I can calculate the fire control solution on board on the transport satellites, I can move those data directly to a weapons platform. That's where the Link 16 comes in. Link 16 is fairly ubiquitous. So we can, we can tie into several different shooters, if you will, as part of the JADC2 infrastructure. So we can move those data directly in so that they can engage that target. And we wanna do that you know, on the order of single digit seconds to be able to do the detection, fire control calculation, and then down to the weapon. That allows you to engage within the window of your interceptor uh, on the time scale. Obviously, if it takes you, you know, 30 seconds to do that, uh, the data that you could be sending to the interceptor is too old and you're not within the window that the interceptor can actually engage a maneuvering target. So that is the idea on what SDA is doing to, to actually go after these new threats. And the timing is, like I said, that tranche one with 144 transport satellites will be, uh, we'll start that launch in September of 2024. Uh, if we get the appropriation to kickstart the tracking layer for tranche one, those will be launched in, in early 2025. So by the end of 2025, we'll be able to have that kernel of tracking satellites and that tranche one transport layer to be able to do that mission, to be able to defend us, do the detection that can defend us against those, those hypersonic glide vehicle threats. Great. Now, I, th I think you mentioned this a little bit about kind of why you went into low Earth orbit for your, your layered constellation, but there are people who are concerned that low Earth orbit is becoming kind of crowded with, with the SpaceX Starlinks and the Kuipers and all those other organizations putting things out there in the hundreds or thousands of even of satellites. What would you say to those people that are concerned about LEO getting too crowded and thereby it's kind of dangerous to be putting all of our stuff there? Certainly, uh, there, you know, there's two, two aspects to, to, to LEO as far as the dangers in, in LEO. And when I, uh, you know, when I was first a DARPA program manager, one of the key goals was to try to move a lot of our, it was right after the, the Chinese 2007 ASAT test. And one of the key things we were focused on was, can we move a lot of the missions that we're doing most of, most of the time, that were the IC missions in LEO, can we move them to, to higher orbits to make it more difficult for ASATs to hit? And so there was a push to that. And so now it's kind of ebbed where we're now, you know, all orbits uh, are, are vulnerable to, to different space attacks. And so now we're, we're looking back, especially as the commercial industry has pushed to make the commoditization of LEO much more affordable. It's kind of ebbing back to say, let's, let's try to do more from LEO. So the point of that is that, that uh, over time, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to, to all the different orbits. And we need to, we need to take advantage of those at the, at the current time we're in. Now for, the, for the, the crowded aspect in particular, two answers to that. The key thing is uh, we need better space situational awareness. So space, space is big. I'm a, you know, there's two schools of, of thought on that and, uh, and, and both are, are correct. Uh, it's just the differences in, in, in assumptions. So I'm in the space is big school of thought, uh, but that saying, Space is only big if your satellites are small. 
And right now, because we have such uncertainty ellipses around where our satellites actually are, uh, based on just based on mostly due to to radar uh, information that comes from the satellite as we as we go through the space fence and such, we treat the satellites as an extremely large sphere or or oval in that in that trajectory. And because of that, uh, space gets more and more crowded because you try to keep you try to keep those satellites out of those very large error ellipses. So as you increase space situational awareness and you get those error ellipses smaller and smaller to where now instead of treating a satellite as if it were one kilometer in one dimension and 10 kilometers in its, uh, in its velocity track, I can actually treat that, that satellite as what it is. You know, it could be a meter, uh, uh, a meter by 10 meters and, and that's all I need to track. Then, then you'll notice that you can actually do space traffic management much better because you'll, you'll have a much better sense of what actually is going on on orbit. That's number one. Number two is you actually have to look at LEO as several different layers. So LEO is not all created equally. So uh, for orbital debris space mitigation policy, uh, everyone wants their satellites to naturally decay after 25 years. That's, that's kind of the, 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 the norm that everyone designs towards. What that means is you want your satellites to orbit less than 600 kilometers. So 600 kilometers and below, just due to the physics and drag, your satellites will, will, will not last longer than 25 years before they naturally re-enter and then burn up in the atmosphere. So if you look at all of a lot of these commercial, not all of them, but a lot of the commercial constellations, and if you look at really where the space is congested, it is at that, that 600 kilometers and below. Between 400 kilometers and 600 kilometers is where a lot of people are putting a lot of satellites up there so they can take advantage of, of that natural uh, satellite decay. And so that's, that's one of the areas that you really need to look to try to avoid. And so for Space Development Agency, our satellites will be in the, in the 1,000 to 1,200 kilometer range. So we're, we're above that. Uh, the disadvantage is now we actually have to engineer in positive deorbit controls so that we can maintain that 25 year deorbit capability. But the advantage is we're in much uh, more open space, uh, you know, space, if you just do the, do the volume, uh, it goes as, as, as the distance, the, the altitude cubed. So we have a much uh, larger volume space to work in as well, the higher up you go. And that's, that's one of the ways where if you look at the thousand kilometers where notionally all of our satellites will be operating, it's, uh, it's not crowded at all. Awesome. Now, I, I know you mentioned that the ASAT test the Chinese had uh, that went into LEO uh, several years ago in 07. And I was curious, based it on, on your, your putting everything in low Earth orbit, where, as you mentioned, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy for at least our two main adversary countries, as was demonstrated with the Russian ASAT test recently, and then a few of them on the Chinese over the last several years. Um, what kind of damage can, can the layers uh, you know, deal with, with that kind of a threat, being able to reach all orbits? I mean, is there because the Chinese have this view of rapid and destructive space warfare as they put in their writings and as they're demonstrating with their deployments. Um, obviously we need to be able to provide robust early warning to defend the homeland from threats like this. I was just wondering how, how, does this, how is this designed to be able to survive that sort of thing? Certainly. So that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the big advantages of a, of a proliferated architecture is, is resilience. So if you look at if you look at an architecture that has these big, fat, juicy targets, as General Heighton has always referred to them as, uh, they, may be, they may be more difficult to hit a single target. And if you have a, a, a single asset, you can, you can take some steps to even try to, try to defend that or, or maneuver it. But if that asset gets taken out, you've lost a very large fraction of your capability. Where if you, if you go to the proliferated architecture, it may be easier to take out individual nodes in that architecture but by nature of that, that proliferation, you can actually take some attrition before you start to have a degradation of your capability. And so that the advantage of that is you are not very vulnerable to a sneak attack, right? Because it will take, it will take weeks, uh, if, if, not, uh, you know, if not months, to get an appreciable degradation of your capability just by taking out these satellites node after node as they, as they come over a, a, a various threat vector. So that's one of the advantages. So to your specific question is, you know, how many, what kind of attrition can we actually absorb before we start to have a, have a degradation of capability? Uh, a lot of that is, you know, we, we don't want to go into a lot of our, uh, a lot of our vulnerability analysis on this, but we can, we can talk in general, generalities about that. 
Uh, our satellites are designed for five-year lifetimes. And when we're up and operational, our plan is to have, you know, on the order of three to 400 satellites per layer providing these missions. The layers being, you know, the transport layer, the tracking layer, custody, which is your ISR layer, and then uh, navigation layer is included as part of transport. But so three to 400 satellites providing each of those, each of those different layers with five-year lifetimes. So just, you know, just in, in round numbers, you can expect that you will have 20% on orbit spares, if you will, at any given time, just to take into account natural attrition because of that five year lifetime. And so uh, if you start to get into a, a shooting match, uh, that's kind of the level that you can expect to absorb before you start to have any appreciable decrease in your capability. That's that's kind of what we're what we're designing towards. And as I said, that that will give you uh, the ability to absorb these these attacks for many days, weeks, uh, even even months, depending on the, the threat vector. Awesome. So with regard to recent technology demos you were kind of talking about, I know STA has partnered with a, a variety of organizations to demonstrate technology, such as the optical inter-satellite links you were mentioning earlier on orbit data fusion. You were, you were also talking in your entry remarks. And I've heard you describe these capabilities as critical enablers, and you mentioned that. Is there any, any elaboration you'd like to make on why these are so important and perhaps share what you've learned so far through these experiments? Sure. So there's the Two main aspects that you mentioned there are our critical enablers. So the optical intersatellite links and the onboard processing. And, and why, why is that so, so critical? Well, optical satellite links have been around for, for a long time. NASA has done a lot of great work as, as well as uh, others within the department historically uh, developing those. So uh, what's, what's the big breakthrough and, and why is that, that chosen going forward? Realistically, the big breakthrough is in size, weight, power, and cost. So if you look historically, uh, optical satellite links uh, have been used when you needed to move huge amounts of data, you know, gigabit type, type processing. And you were, looking at, you were looking at payloads to do that that were $100 million at the, at the most. You know, the cheapest would be multiple tens of millions of dollars because they really were designed for these kind of exquisite missions to move a lot of data in very specific, uh, bespoke, uh, engineered solutions. Going forward, uh, the real shift is not going to be in the fact, can you do laser communication in space? Because that's, as I mentioned, it's been demonstrated, but it is, can you do it affordably in a very uh, low size, weight, and power system that could be proliferated, and there's been a lot of advances in that. I mean, if you if you look at if you look at what the commercial industry is doing, SpaceX is, is one example that is is proliferating uh, optical crosslinks, and and there's been a lot of there's a lot of the the tier two or tier three subcontract suppliers that have that have developed an infrastructure to be able to produce these. So now they're you know they're I uh, don't want to give away proprietary costing data, but it is, you know, it is orders of magnitude less than the, than the $10 million price that uh, has been seen in the past. And the swap is consistent with the smaller size that can be put on satellites so that we feel confident when we put out these solicitations and we get bids back from industry that we can put three and four of these optical satellite links on the, on the spacecraft themselves so that they can form this mesh network and also form the network to the ground. So why is that important? It's important because optical by, by design is, is essentially very uh, low probability of intercept and low probability of detection, right? It's a very narrow beam. Uh, you have to be within that beam to be able to, to detect or be able to, to, to jam uh, the signal. So it's essentially Im impossible to jam because you, 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 would have to, you would have to do point to point jamming within that, that optical crosslink uh, line of sight so that, that kind of takes jamming off the table. So, so inter-satellite links with, uh, with optics take jamming off the table. The other aspect is you can, with, with very low power, so if you look at the, the power per bit, you know, your orders of magnitude lower for power per bit of data as you transmit than if you will over RF. That's for two reasons. One, it's, it's very efficient to generate, uh, to generate the, the optical signal itself primarily because of the advancements that have been made in the, in the fiber optic telecommunications industry. So you capitalize on that. And then the second aspect is because of that narrow beam width, you know, you don't waste a lot of, of energy and spillover. So that allows you to get the high data rates 
in these very low size, weight, and power systems. And that, that's, what, that's what enables you to, to do a lot of these proliferated missions on this, on this aspect, to really pass a lot of data. The other aspect is onboard processing. So onboard processing is really important for two reasons. Number one, if I'm able to pass 100 megabit per second over an optical crosslink, or even several gigabit per second over an optical crosslink, but I can't really do anything with those data on the satellite. All I've set up is, is a bent pipe that can move data from satellite to the ground and then do processing on the ground and then move it back up. That's, that's very useful. And that's actually our, our plan on Tron Zero is to demonstrate that because it allows you to form this first network. But the main idea is I wanna be able to do that processing on board. So that's going to require that I do decryption and encryption on board at those kind of speeds. And if you look at those speeds, historically, that has been impossible to do without a, a, a very powerful processor to do the hardware encryption and decryption. So we want to move to onboard processing using software encryption and decryption so that we can actually do that uh, in coordination with NSA approved techniques all on board. And then once you do that, once I can do the encryption and decryption, I can start to process data. I can fuse data coming from other sources. Those sources could be coming from commercial uh, sensing platforms. I can fuse that with some of my classified sensing platforms to be able to actually create uh, a, a, a picture, a, a global reference operating picture that I can send down to theater so that uh, that's, that's the whole JADC2 vision. I take data from any sensor, wherever it's available, could be even a commercial sensor. I fuse that with all the data sets I have, and I do that on board on the satellite, and then I send that down to any shooter. That's the JADC2 vision, and that, those are the two key enabler technologies that, that allow us to do that from space. Awesome. Well, that's outstanding. So I, I did, I think you mentioned commercial partners, and one thing that I, I read recently is that SDA awarded a contract to Capella Space to demonstrate the capability of their synthetic aperture radar satellites with the National Defense Space Architecture using optical inner satellite links. And it was just curious, is this intended uh, as a model for how you plan on integrating commercial space capabilities? Um, and I'm assuming this ties back into what you were talking earlier about serving as the backbone for JADC2. Exactly. This is the model, and it's the model not only for commercial partners, but uh, our international uh, allied partners, as well as other government mission partners. So there's a lot of different, uh, different entities out there that are developing constellations of, of sensing uh, platforms. And we want to be able to pull that all onto the transport layer so that we can fuse those at a, you know, ultimately at a minimum, move those to a targeting cell as rapidly as possible using the transport layer and then get that to the shooter. So what we've put in place uh, on this contract with Capella is to demonstrate that that can be done, demonstrate that we can take one of our compatible optical crosslinks, put that onto a commercial platform and have that commercial platform talk directly to our, to our transport layer. And that is a model that we would use going forward. And that's one of the reasons that we, we need this onboard processing so that you can, have, you can have different levels of security on the satellite itself so that you, you, when you have different trusted sensor feeds, you can, you can treat those differently. Awesome. Now, I, I know you mentioned this in your intro remarks, but I know one of the interesting things that people are, are interested about is the transition of uh, SDA over to Space Force. And I know you mentioned where you would report, but I think it might be useful for folks listening in, especially those that may have tuned in late for you to explain how uh, the SDA uh, transition to Space Force is going to play out and where you will fall again under the uh, Space Force chain of command. Certainly. So the, uh, the NDA 21 was actually very, very prescriptive on how this would happen on, on uh, in law, how SDA would transition and, and where it would fall in. And essentially it says that on October 1, 2022, uh, 37 weeks, SDA will transition into the Space Force as a, as a direct reporting unit to the, the Chief of Space Operations for everything except for acquisition related uh, chain of command. In that case, then we'll report and get the acquisition authorities through the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration. And, and that's, that's essentially, so we will be a uh, direct reporting unit in that way. So if you look at it, if you look at uh, uh, Space Systems Command, uh, Space RCO, Space Rapid Capabilities Office, and the Space Development Agency, those are, those are three 
uh, entities that are that are equal and able to to provide uh, different means of, of developing and fielding systems for the space force, and so each one would would then have the the reporting through the CSO and and the ASAP for for acquisition, and so that's. That's uh, that's what uh, what is in in the current law, and then in NDA 22, it reiterated that for the SDA tranche zero and tranche one programs, that the uh, the ASAP as the service acquisition executive for space should delegate as uh, as much as possible the the head of contracting activity and milestone decision authority for those SDA tranche zero and tranche one programs, so that SDA can continue to operate and run with alacrity as we've demonstrated up to this point. Outstanding, and that was also a great use of the word alacrity. We don't hear that word very often. So with that, we're gonna now uh, switch over to the questions from the audience uh, who have been listening to our conversation so far. As a reminder to our listeners, you can participate in the Q&A by using the raise hand function on your device. And when uh, you are called upon, please unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation for our guests uh, before asking your question. And you can also submit the question in writing using the Q&A function, in which case Lucas will read the question aloud uh, to our guests. So with that, uh, go ahead and let's let's answer some questions. Okay, great. Uh, let's first go to uh, Teresa Hitchens. Hi, Tarek. This is Teresa, Breaking Defense. Uh, Happy New Year, and thanks for doing this this morning. Um, my question is about integration of the tracking layer both with the next gen OPIR satellites as they come online, if you could talk about how those satellites are going to either talk to each other or the data is going to be shared, how they're gonna to work together and how the tracking layer satellites will then fit into the even larger architecture, the force design that the SWAC has come up with for missile warning and missile tracking. So those two integration aspects. Um, if you could just kind of elaborate on how that's going to work. Thank you. Certainly. Happy New Year, Teresa. So the, uh, uh, the next gen OPIR uh, for, 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 for GEO in particular, as, as, as they're, they're uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be launched in the, in the 2025 timeframe. Uh, they, the, the way that they'll be integrated with the tracking satellites, which will launch about the same, same time frame, is primarily all on the ground. So what that means is the way, the way we do OPIR data fusion is we, we get the data down to the ground and we have uh, what's called a, a, a real-time real uh, system to be able to send data around to, to different targeting cells. And that's all part of what's called, what's known as the JOG, Joint OPIR Ground. And so the, the JOG takes these, these RTS data feeds from any and all satellite systems. So that would come from next-gen OPIR, it would come from tracking layer, and it would come from the legacy SIVRs and uh, uh, satellites as well. All of those get into the, the joint OPIR ground, which is essentially what, what MDA and SSC, previously SMC, have developed over the years as part of the OPIR ground to make sure that they have the hooks in place to take all of these OPIR data feeds and fuse those into three-dimensional tracks. Once those tracks are fused, uh, they are then disseminated out, uh, typically over, uh, typically over, over UHF, or, or other uh, Link 16 networks than two, two weapons platforms. And so ideally what would happen is the data would all come down. Uh, the data would come down both from the, the SDA tracking layer, would come down via our transport layer, and then it would go to our, to our ops centers and then fed directly via this RTS system into the JOG same way as the, the next gen OPIR systems and the, and the SIBR systems, their data comes down, goes over RTS into, into the JOG. The JOG will then form those 3D tracks from any and all OPIR sensors that are available. Then disseminate those OPIR tracks out via, and those OPIR tracks, by the way, could be merged with radar tracks. Any and all data all get sent into that, into that, that JOG for data fusion. So then those data then get sent out uh, via traditional ways to get to get to folks like Aegis and, and other uh, other folks deployed, as well as get sent directly up to the transport layer. So then transport can send that down directly via KA optical 
and link 16 to whoever needs to, to have those data in, in theater. So that's how, that's how those would, would all, all fit together going, going forward. And that, that's, you know, that's, that's how we, we see that. And then as, as the, the spirals mature, uh, ideally you would want to be able to have connectivity from any and all OPIR systems to the transport layer so they could be fused on board. But because of the fact that, you know, next gen OPIR 2025, it's a, it's a long development program. Uh, we, we don't want to, we don't want to disturb that by, by trying to add in that connectivity to the transport layer at this point, we're going to do that all, all through the ground. And that's part of what the SWAC study has shown is the SWAC study has said the future OPIR architecture for missile warning, missile tracking should be this kind of a hybrid layer. We should have, we should have satellites that are, that are working at, at GEO, the next gen OPIR GEO satellites. We should have the proliferated LEO to be able to give us the, the sensitivity we need for hypersonic glide vehicle tracking and give us that full global uh, coverage. And then we should also have some satellites at MEO to be able to add in, add in resiliency in the, in the event that one or multiple layers are, are attacked you can have that resiliency and you can fuse all of those data via the ground. And that's one of the things that, that SSC is, is tasked with to making sure that that systems of systems approach of tying all of these systems together into that joint OPIR ground can actually work and then disseminate those data. Okay, we'll just move on to the next one then. Uh, Jerry Krasner. Derek. Jerry. How are you? Outstanding. As usual. Uh, my question will come in a different vein from uh, what you've been discussing, and just curiosity. Uh, come October and beyond, uh, when SDA is integrated into Space Force, will SDA retain its own staffing and hiring uh, independence, or is it worked out how that might evolve? Uh, yes, that, that's actually in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the AA21 uh, joint explanatory language. It it uh, it it's, it spells out that that SDA uh, with with the uh, with the hiring authorities that it has uh, prior to transfer will be the same post transfer. So SDA will will maintain uh, all of those HR uh, activities and and special hiring authorities that it has in place today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. We're going to take a, a quick question from the chat, and this comes from uh, General Paul Selva. He says, uh, in your vision of the future, who, uh, what service, what units will be operating the satellites in the variety of layers, sensing, transport, custody, et cetera, as the Space Force program for the necessary human resources and training to make an integrated architecture useful to the warfighters across all services? So that's, uh, that's one of the things that General Whiting and I have had uh, discussions on. So it's clearly all the operational satellites will be operated by Space Operations Command. So the SPOC will we'll operate those as far as what, you know, what units and, and, and uh, beyond that level, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's up to, to General Whiting. I don't, I don't know the details on, on that. It, they probably haven't been, been worked out, but that will be done by the SPOC. So here's the plan for what, uh, where, how SDA would, would transition operations. So SDA will operate in this uh, government-owned contracting, contractor-operated environment at Grand Forks Air Force Base and Redstone Arsenal, as I mentioned. That's where we will have our satellite operations, network operations, and mi mission operations all being done. Primarily, the satellite operations and networking operations will be done by contractors on site at those two facilities. And then the mission operations will be done by both uniformed and civilian personnel, making sure that the prioritization of the missions uh, takes place based on, based on COCOM tasking. So SDA will get those two operation centers up and up and operating, uh, take the tranche one constellation through test and checkout and you know operational test and evaluation. And then once they're once they are ready to once they are ready to transition over, those op centers, essentially the staff at those op centers will transition a whole cloth to be reporting from SDA to reporting to the SPOC so that they will be part of the operational space operations command so that the satellites will then be able to, to be used in a method that's consistent with tasking from the uh, from space command through through space operations command. So hopefully that uh, that clarifies that. Okay, great. Uh, next we'll go to uh, Courtney Alvin. 
Hi, yes, uh, Courtney Albin with uh, C4ISRnet. Um, I had another question on the uh, SDA uh, transition to the Space Force. Um, just on the, the area of acquisition authorities, um, I know there were some questions about what authorities SDA will retain. And I, I just wonder, have those, um, have those been worked out? And what other kind of big uh, questions remain that still need to be kind of answered as you have this kind of working group that's, that's uh, determining that? So as as uh, as you mentioned, there is that working group that that's going forward. Essentially, it's being uh, you know it's being run by by Secretary Kendall and uh, and uh, Secretary Shu and in in uh, R and E working out how this how this trans transfer will will occur. And a lot of those details are being worked out there. One of the one of the key aspects is uh, uh, Secretary Kendall wants to to allow the the new ASAF. To come on board and be able to, to weigh in on some of that, so some of those some of those decisions are are pending uh, onboarding of the of the new ASAF, which will be the SAE for space, so that so that they you know their their inputs can can weigh in. Most of the most of the the language in NDA twenty two has spelled out you know how a lot of those acquisition authorities will work for Tranche Zero and Tranche One as far as what uh, what authority should be delegated. Uh, head of contracting activity and milestone decision authority for the middle tier of acquisition programs that are currently ongoing. So that's kind of all, already uh, already in law. But as far as how SDA uh, will uh, will work, uh, a lot of the details between what aspects of the you know of the architecture are done at SSC, SDA, those kind of things will uh, those details will still need to be worked out. And that's one of the one of the things that is pending the ASAP confirmation. Okay, great. We'll go to uh, Brianna Riley. Thanks so much for doing this, Brianna Riley here from Inside Defense. Circling back to authorities, you know, as we were just talking about that, SDA will retain post transition. You have previously pushed for SDA to retain head of contract authority, senior procurement executive, and milestone decision authority. How is that looking thirty seven weeks out from this transition? Thank you. So that kind of uh, you know gets to in in NDA twenty two it uh, it it said that the you know the 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 SAE should delegate for tranche zero and tranche one those those authorities the head of contracting and, and milestone decision authority um, the uh, those so that's that's looking that's looking good to allow us to continue to to execute uh, with the speed that we've demonstrated uh, going forward that's one of the things that that we're we're trying to determine, you know, exactly how does this this all work out? Obviously, uh, you know, the, the the new ASAF coming in as the SAE for space should should have some, you know, obviously has to have the purview to be able to determine how the architecture is set up and run. And part of that means how does how does the how does the overall uh, infrastructure of the acquisition organizations how how are those set up and, and operating? And so that's why. We're kind of pending that that confirmation. Okay, great. Next, we have a written in question. Uh, can you explain the mission demarcations between SDA and MDA regarding missile defense? Uh, will there be an integrated CONAP between MDA and SDA? So uh, SDA obviously is focused on on satellites and and the proliferated architecture, and MDA is focused on uh, making sure that the data gets disseminated and calculated into a fire control solution so that that uh, missile defense can can achieve. So for for space in particular, uh, MDA and SDA have worked very closely together to put together what uh, what a future hybrid architecture would look like between satellites that do missile warning, missile tracking, and then satellites that uh, uh, are necessary for doing actual targeting uh, once once the new uh, next gen interceptors and glide phase interceptors come online in the you know in the 2028 uh, and out time frame so that we can actually make sure that we get quality of service to those satellites so there there'll be some kind of mixture of of a hybrid architecture on on those technologies MDA uh, is is set up to to do technology development and demonstration uh, just like they're doing on on the HBTSS phase phase 2B uh, program where they're going to fly two satellites in March of 2023 to demonstrate that that medium field of view that can be used for, for targeting quality of service. And along with the with the eight that SDA is going to fly to show that we can do the, the, uh, the, the global coverage for the missile warning missile tracking. The uh, going forward, 
that's, uh, that's, that's the ideal arrangement is that MDA as a defense agency will continue to do technology development and demonstration for technology that then would be transitioned and proliferated by SDA as part of the Space Force to give an operational organized, train and equip function from a, from a service to be able to disseminate and populate those. So that's, that's how I see it uh, going forward. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Dave Sapper. He asks, uh, what about leveraging the huge number of commercial platforms in that lower LEO space to host uh, a large number of SDA payloads? Uh, doesn't uh, that add new, doesn't, uh, doesn't add new satellites to the crowded orbit and gets even closer to see even dimmer targets? So two, two aspects. So the commercial, the, the main way we want to leverage uh, commercial constellations are if they're, if they're commercial uh, sensing constellations like we're doing with Capella. We want to pull those data in and, and be able to disseminate that. Second way is uh, we would like to have our transport layer be able to use commercial transport layers, commercial comm layers uh, ubiquitously so that we could move DOD data on and off of those from our transport layer. So for example, we could have a, a translator sat that moves data from the, from the transport layer to Starlink or to Kuiper uh, and be able to, to use those uh, as alternatives to be able to move DOD time sensitive data around different networks. As far as hosting specific payloads on, uh, on, on satellites that, that were not designed, you have a comm satellite that's not designed to, to host specific uh, payloads. We are talking with some commercial entities ab about those those possibilities, but nothing, nothing on, along that line has been set in stone yet. At this point, the, the payloads that are DOD specific, a lot of those payloads will drive a lot of the requirements and could have uh, you know, a significant impact on the commercial pa uh, platforms themselves. And so it, it may, may not be a, a great fit. That's why we're, we're proliferating out the tracking satellites, if you will, primarily as DOD owned and operated satellites themselves but we are looking at the possibility of being able to put as adjunct payloads on, on commercial constellations. Okay, great, uh, just switching lanes a little bit here. Uh, could you please clarify further the timing and plans for transport tranche one and how the current uh, continuing resolution scenarios will impact your ability to award and execute? So transport tranche one uh, will have six launches uh, starting in September of 2024. And then, uh, and then a, a, a basically a launch a month after that for the next six months to get uh, to get to March of 2025 when we will have all all of the transport tranche one satellites on orbit, and that we are going through source selection for that now. Uh, we have enough uh, enough funding through the through the continuing resolution to be able to to award those contracts for for tranche one. We we anticipate we're working within the department. And we anticipate uh, being able to to fund all of the uh, all of the other contracts associated with Transport Tranche One. So, for example, our operations and integration contract, which I mentioned, and our tides, the Tranche One development and experimental satellites, to be able to operate that under uh, under tracking. So, tracking to be able to accelerate tracking to start tracking Tranche One in FY22, we will need. We will need an Appropriations Act signed with funding that includes a plus up for that tracking, which was in the in the SACD language. So none of that will occur under a continuing resolution. That would only occur if we receive FY22 funding to be able to do that. Otherwise, obviously, SDA is uh, is uh, had a had a major growth from FY21 to FY22, and so there are uh, there are continuing resolution limits. And we're working within the department, uh, within the comptroller, to make sure that, that we can we can operate uh, with our milestone payments to keep our tranche one schedule. There is one hiccup to that that uh, we we can't get around, and that is our tranche one launch vehicles are being procured via NSSL, the National Space Security Launch. That is a, a procurement dollars, so that is a, an actual new start. And so for new start funding, you cannot start a, a new uh, start under, uh, uh, under a continuing resolution. So that is the danger is that it, it could hold up our contract award for our first launch vehicle for tranche one transport. But other than that, that's, that's kind of what we're, what we're tracking. Obviously, 
the, the sooner we get an FY22 budget act passed, the better, but that's, that's kind of where we stand. Okay, great. Uh, next one comes from uh, Tom Doyne. He says, well, what missions or roles do you envision for the CubeSat form factors? Uh, do you think CubeSats have a place in a hybrid architecture? So uh, to, to answer that, I'll tell a little bit of, of history that I have with, with small sats. So, you know, to take, take this with a, with a grain of salt. So uh, when I was a DARPA program manager, I was a, a big believer in, uh, you know, large satellites. You needed, you needed to be able to do national security missions. You really needed to have power aperture. You needed large satellites. I didn't think there was a, a big future for a lot of smaller satellites to be able to do national security missions. It wasn't until 2015 when uh, at that time I was in industry and, and we did some, some missions with half ESPA class satellites that were extremely impressive, being able to, to produce quality that was consistent with, with some of the very large national technical means kind of satellites. And we said, okay, that's when the scales fell off my eyes. And I said, I, I've been wrong about these small satellites all along. They can actually do national security missions. And this is kind of the future. And at that point, I, you know, I, I became a, a big believer and, and I, I got the small sat tattoo and, and said, this is the future. So going forward, you know, I still say that the sweet spot of satellites is in that three to 500 kilogram class, because that gives you enough power to be able to have enough duty cycle. Uh, so if you look at, you know, CubeSats 3U, 6U, 12U, uh, you know, what, what is that, what does that buy you? Clearly it buys you a way to do, to do tech insertion and, and flight qualification and, and prove out these new, new concepts. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the demonstrations that, that we flew, uh, the six satellites that we flew, well, one of them was, was flown, uh, uh on the ISS resupply mission as part of, uh, that was, that was, uh, purple, that was a larger satellite, but otherwise we, those were all, those were all CubeSats. Uh, they were they were either six U or, or twelve U depending on the mission. So it shows that that there's really a lot of uh, capability to be able to do those demonstrations. But that said, uh, based on the lesson learned that I had going from 2007 to, to when I saw the light in 2015, when I went from all satellites needed to be at a minimum 1,500 kilograms to okay 300 kilograms, you can really do some some good things. Doesn't say that going forward. Uh, there may be some really good national security missions that you can do with 3U and, and up to 12U CubeSats, primarily in SIGINT detection, you know, if you get very good RF uh, uh, quality detection, or you start to do special comms missions, you can do those. A lot of those can be done on small sats, but uh, I'm still still waiting to see what that, what that market plays out. I agree. That's I think great. One more. Uh, this comes from Scott Sage. He says, can you talk about the confidence you have that the cybersecurity concerns can be mitigated for rapid development of proliferated LEO assets? So the two biggest concerns I have with proliferation are, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about uh, attrition, as I mentioned. Uh, that's where proliferation buys you. But for common mode failures, obviously, if you have a common mode failure, proliferation doesn't buy you a lot. And the two common mode failures that I worry about Number one is cyber, and number two is supply chain, uh, supply chain interdiction, as well as being able to maintain a supply chain to keep these two-year cycles up. So those are the those are the two common mode failures. But that said, there I, I think that securing hundreds of satellites with with optical laser communication between them is certainly a, a feasible task. We've got a lot of activities in place that are that that uh, are part of our tranche one transport layer that are requirements on the vendors to make sure that they have certain cybersecurity activities in place. A lot of that was part of the Space Force has, has created kind of a, a, a space cyber uh, best practices statement that they, they worked with with MITRE to count, come up with, you know, these are kind of the things to, to make sure that your, your networks are secure in space. We're incorporating all of that into our, into our tranche one. So we, you can do this, the optical laser com helps you with that because it, it makes things more secure, but it's something that you have to be intentional about. You have to take into account from the beginning. You have to do red teams, which we have a red cell to focus on this to make sure that, that you're looking for it and you're not ignoring it. Well, that's outstanding. I know we could, we could spend all day chatting about all this awesome stuff that's going on over at SCA, but sadly, we've come to the end of this edition of the Shriver Space Power Forum. A big thanks to you, uh, sir, Dr. Trenier, uh, for being here with us again today, and to you and our, all of our audience, from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence, we wish you all a very great day. Thanks very much. Thank you.